go. Greetings and salutations, Earthlings on this beautiful planet. Welcome. It's another epi of League Unlock. My name is Eric Flynn, a little Han Solo for today's Global Power Rankings Week 3 action 20 to 1. Lots of shakeup on the bottom half of the board this week, and a lot of that comes from a spicy surprise somewhat disaster of a weekend in the LCS for some squads not disaster for many others and obviously we accelerate into playoffs of the LEC so getting best of threes gives us more uh, more opportunity and more to judge for all of these squads in EU so 20 to 11 is where a lot of that shakeup is and of course some squads no longer on the list first and foremost is cloud nine Four game losing streak in not impressive zero and three super week means they are bumped, ousted. I never thought they'd be out of the top 20 at all this split, but that's exactly where they end up. Jojo Pian did an interview recently with Ashley Kangs saying he's fine. It's, you know, it makes the LCS more interesting now that they're actually losing games and not going undefeated, but uh, make sure to keep watching them. Love the confidence. JoJo always has it. I'm fully expecting them to bounce back as well. Uh, but at least right now, not in the top 20. And NRG holding on by a single fingernail in that number 20 spot. It was a one and two week for them as well. Dropping games to, again, typically bottom of the barrel squads in Shopify and Immortals. But still, if you look at any of these other teams, Team Liquid, 100 Thieves, Immortals, another matchup you'd still feel like NRG are going to be favorites in that one, and they didn't look as bad in these losses as Cloud9 did in some of them. So NRG down six spots, but still just eking out a spot on this top 20 list. And because they get dropped down so much, Cloud9 is ousted. Even though Mad Lions lost their series uh, against Fnatic, they still hold on and move up a spot, number one, because it was so... It was incredibly competitive. You had that absolutely slapper of a game that went back and forth almost 50 minutes. And that combined with Cloud9, NRG, RNG getting ousted uh, from these top 20s or dropping a whole bunch means that they move up a spot. And in tandem with that, a squad who actually won their first series in playoffs is Team Vitality, who surprise shocked stole this top 20 spot from SK Gaming, who were hanging out here last week, a swift 2-0 out of them. And even though they lost to BDS, there was still lots of positive signs and we're feeling very good about them heading into that loser's bracket. And surprisingly so that we're talking about them. I mean, starting with the 0-3 start in the winter split and even... You know, they had the 3-0 in the middle, but how they went into playoffs, at least I wasn't picturing and seeing this squad kind of rise and ascend to this level of actual contention where obviously Viteo was playing at a really high level, but Daglas, because he was thrown in such a horrible spot last year as a rookie, seeing him actually get his footing under him, having time to develop, it's developed a lot quicker than I was expecting. So Team Vitality played at this level already leaps and bounds more uh, than you could have hoped for with how things started for this squad. Invictus Gaming, if you haven't paid attention to the LPL too much, this spring split, you might be surprised to see him here. You're probably even more surprised to see IG sporting a 4-1 and one record. And then you might be saying, forward one? How's the squad not way higher up these rankings? Well, those wins. Rare Adam, Thunder Talk, Ultra Prime, and RNG combined between those four teams. You're talking about uh, four wins. Half of those coming from RNG. A couple winless and a couple uh, one win squads. So they have had a very easy schedule so far. Uh, that lone loss to NIP, I believe. So once they did face an actual contending team, uh, they got dropped down. But RNG had a 2-1 and one start. We had them in the top 20, but they have not looked good since then. So they're out of there. IG, even though it is an easy schedule so far, you got to give credit where credit is due. They've won those matchups four out of five, so they deserve to be on this list. The contrast with LNG, a squad ahead of them with a 2-3 and three record. Obviously, I can do the math. 2-3, and three, worse than 4-1. and one. LNG... 
If I pitched them head-to-head against IG right now, I'd have them as favorites. I'd expect them to win the game. I'd expect them to 2-0 that series, honestly. LNG has had a much more difficult schedule. Yes, they had the bad opening week loss to Thunder Talk. That was inexcusable. But the other two losses they've had are to JDG and BLG, who, in case you haven't noticed, are the only undefeated teams in the LPL and were the two best teams all year long. Last split looks to remain the same. They took a game off of JDG and they played a couple of competitive, especially game one, competitive against Billy Billy. So there's still signs that LNG can be legit contenders. And even though they lost some, they can now check off BLG and JDG off that schedule and move into the easier part of it as we uh, transition to the post Lunar New Year over in the LPL. So fully expect LNG to slowly start climbing back towards that top 10. I'm not so sure D-plus is going to be climbing back towards that top 10. I feel like they're one week away from getting bumped out of the top 20. They slide yet again. It's two teams ahead of them in the standings that they lost to. Yes, Guangdong and Hanwha, but it was the fashion that they lost in. Didn't pick up a single game weren't even really competitive in those four game losses that they had to those two squads. So there's there's a lot to work on, a lot of issues that D-plus has. This week off for them might help them, boost them up quite a bit as we head into the next weekend. They got the slowest game time in the entire LCK at almost 34 minutes. To me, that's talking about you don't know how to close out games because they've had sizable leads in a lot of those games that took them that long to claim uh, to close out and that comes down to whether it's communication game sense map control all of the macro aspects of the competitive scene which is what we have seen d plus struggle with even when canyon was back on the roster and basically ever since barrel left the squad that has been the main thorn in their side and it looks like it continues to be in 2024 a couple actual positives some boost ups on this list is Fnatic climbing up to 14 yes they lost to G2 but they played an absolutely the series absolutely lived up to the hype it was the only three game set over the playoffs and even that game three you had Fnatic fully not fully in control in the early game until that Zach top truly came online for Broken Blade, but uh, still feel very good about Fnatic going forward, being a squad that should get to finals weekend. And still, even though G2 and less so BDS are going to be the favorites going forward, still has the potential for Fnatic to take home a split crown either in winter or as the year progresses over in the LEC. The bot lane, Noah and Jun finally been leveling up in these playoffs, which is the last check we needed to tick uh, on that list for Fnatic. LCS, FlyQuest is holding it down for the boys. Cloud9 gone, NRG two f- one foot out the door, but FlyQuest had a clean, calm, cool, collected 3-0 weekend over Super Week. As we've already touched on, Masu and Busio got the step up. Whippo looks comfortable on I mean, we've already seen him play some wacky stuff and he's going to be playing off meta probably the whole year. That's what he was known for on Fnatic, getting the Rengar top. We've seen Mordekaiser with this year. Even Greg is top. Less people are playing Olaf. I'm sure this dude can play all the gods, champions that Adam became famous for. But him and Inspired both have not missed a beat since returning to the competitive scene. And as a whole, I mean... It looks like everyone's on the same page. It looks like the communication is on point, which is the biggest thing a lot of LCS teams struggle with. So six and one start FlyQuest deserving of that climb up. Kwangdong, they only played one series since we last did these rankings. It was against Gen G. Competitive game one, gets smashed in game two. Even getting 2 0 by Gen G is not enough to really influence where they are on this spot. Still deserving of being in that 12 spot seems like a safe area uh, to talk about for them. And they still got potential to maybe be knocking, knock, knocking on that top 10. Weibo wasn't knocking on top 10. They were hovering around top five, but an underwhelming week from them. They, I mean, we'll touch on the team that they lost to most recently in top esports. They had no business losing that game too, but they end up getting swept away from them. They've looked 
a little bit shaky. Also had that series loss to LNG. So, again, even though it's been such a difficult schedule for LNG, they were still able to take down Weibo. We talked about the first week or two we were doing this. Definitely some carryover from the World Finals run. But Xiaohu doesn't quite... He's not in that Spring Emperor form yet. ZDZ... Not the shy. Zhao Hao has been fantastic for them in the jungle, so that's the one uh, highlight alongside Light. This is still a team that can be a dark horse, can be a contender when playoffs roll around, but they just didn't have it this week on the Rift. Rolling in to a little bit of top 10 action. It's another big climb for a different LPL squad. We are talking about the Ninjas in Pajamas, who have the same record as IG, but... They've looked oh so much more dominant in those wins, have had a slightly more difficult schedule. They've already played against JDG. That's been their only loss. So anytime your only loss is at the hands of JDG, you're probably doing something pretty right in the LPL. But they have the highest first blood percentage and dragon percentage and the second highest overall team kda so far in the LPL. And that's going up against some heavy hitters that they're putting up those numbers Rookie, don't ever call our boy washed because that only summons him to reach new heights. Shanji is looking great in his first team, not named OMG. Aki is still inting a little bit, so sure up that, that uh, jungle pressure and the jungle deaths and NIP is going to be an even higher level because Fotic has not missed a beat. He was looking great even on this organization when they were bad. He was the lone bright spot. Well, now there's multiple other bright spots that you can talk about for NAP, NIP. These guys look like legit contenders in the LPL right now. Business as usual for BDS. A couple more 2-0s as they advance to the next round. Keeping pace with what G2 is putting up. And I know I've seen people harping on them because they play the same play style. They don't get punished in the LEC. They don't have an answer for it. But what do you want them to do? They keep winning until somebody truly tests them. We're hoping, banking on it being G2. They're going to keep running these different gods champions uh, for Adam in the top lane. But I actually feel like they've showed a little bit more play style diversity uh, and switched things up from what we've been seeing in splits past going back to 2023. So I think this form of BDS is actually stronger than what we were getting out of the team uh, that beat Golden Guardians and went to the World Championship last year. So I'm excited to see them get tested in these best of fives against the best teams in EU. Sandwiched in between these two EU squads, KT Rollstar staying put in that eighth spot. I mean, they 2 0 the bros this week. They needed three games against DRX. They needed to come from behind win in that third game. They still won the series, so we're not going to dock them too many points and bump them out of the top 10 or anything. But was it dominant enough against the bottom two teams in the LCK to really feel like we could bump them up into that next tier? Especially when G2 is looking like Worlds. 2023 was an anomaly and they are fully back in that best team king of eu king of the west we are so used to comfortable accustomed to ranking them as the highest western team and here we are it's no different number seven usually about where g2 can peak on these lists maybe you know honestly early very early days of this spring split feel like they could maybe crack into number six but top five is Always a challenge because it's such an unbelievably stacked field of talent. But the meta is perfect for them where the the thing still remains the same. The strongest point of G2 remains the same. And that is just draft adaptability and diversity. We're seeing it. BB's playing carries. He's playing Zach Top. Whatever's broken. Caps is always the fastest to learn new champions as you've seen with Wei. Mickey gets to cook when uh, it's either Kalista or Senna that Han Sama is spanning. That just opens up so many opportunities for Mickey to play something wacky in at support. And even Yike, we know Lilia, Belveth, all these kind of pocket picks that we've seen out of him are where he can take things over. So G2 is able to just have so much fun in draft and that has translated to 
being impossible to ban out for any of these other squads in EU. Still not in that sixth spot for now because Hanwha Life also got a little bit of a bump. A nice bounce back week for them after the debacle that was that head-to-head -head showdown against T1. They still prove that they can beat everybody else in the LCK. They haven't played Gen G yet, but anyone that's not those top two titans, Hanwha Life look a cut above the rest. Peanut... Uh, and really the other Gen G members as well coming in. They have leveled up the macro gameplay for Hanwha Life. They seem to actually know what they have to do around the Rift, which makes sense because Peanut is one of the best generals that we have in the LCK and has transitioned into that veteran shot caller leadership role absolutely seamlessly, basically ever since he had that year in the LPL with JDG, or excuse me, LGD. Uh, he has been fantastic in his returns to the LCK, you know, the Nongshim stint where he was there with a lot of young guys leading Gen G, a lot of the guys winning their first ever LCK title, and then of course, you know, winning three of them in a row. So Hanwha Life, a team that can absolutely still level up and contest Gen G and T1 for those top two spots. Not too many changes in the top five. It's looking like we're getting Locked in, not locked in, but a comfortable VIP lounge where people are getting, they can order their regular drinks, their regular food, and everybody knows because these guys are here week in and week out. But the new kids for this week are top esports. The question is, are they here to stay? Still the only team to even take a game off of Billy Billy Gaming, and that is the only game or series that they have lost now at three and one. And they, these series that they have been winning, they have been obliterating because they have the fastest game time in the region under 28 and a half minutes, 28 minutes and 22 seconds, a full minute and a half faster than the second fastest game time, which is FPX because they're losing a lot of games. So they have been speed running their way through. Weibo, the latest victim. Jackie Love and Mako have been absolutely deadly in the 2v2s, and you saw it in both games of this series. But let's be... Weibo had no business dropping game two. TES had no business winning game two, but 369 absolutely showcasing that my man can still play carries. One of the most perfect rumble ulties you will ever see in a bush. Eventually nets him a quadra kill. They're down like 5k at this point, but the rumble gets three different shutdowns in this fight, and then he just gets completely out of control. He completely turns the game around, and Cream had a very suspect series, and he's still... The fact the top esports have looked so good and Cream is not playing at the highest level should be cause for concern, but I feel like Cream's going to sort some things out because Jackie Love and 369, the two focal points for this squad, the two main carries, and they have both been absolutely deadly. Combine that with the veterans of Mako and Tien kind of leading what to do on the Rift. We know Mako is one of the greatest shot callers in the history of the LPL, and that has been the piece that was missing for top esports. Even when Knight was on the roster, when Rookie was on the roster, they've been They've looked lost after laning phase. Hasn't been the case so far. Mako has definitely shored that up for them, and they look like they can be legit contenders. The problem is, they're still JDG and BLG ahead of them. Perfect 8-0 combined between them. Still waiting for more games out of JDG. They've only played three series, and, uh, you know, they've... Needed to go three games against a squad like LNG, sure, but they still... Not quite looking like the squad to beat because BLG has been a bit of a different animal. And the biggest level up or scariest part of BLG so far hasn't been Knight coming over. It's been the level Jun has been playing at. Absolutely right now, this guy's the best jungler in the LPL. Kindred's got to be perma-banned against him. But even all of these meta picks, he is so unbelie unbelievably aggressive and confident. And why shouldn't he be confident? Because BLG, the last year plus, they're, they've dropped like what, three regular season series total across multiple splits. And now it's another 5-0 start. Bin, feel like he hasn't even really had to do too much. Elkin on and as consistent as ever in that bot lane. And yes, Knight on this squad has not missed a beat since he's been there. So BLG, JDG absolutely remaining the squads to beat in the LPL. But don't look as 
unbeatable, although BLG, again, has only dropped a single game. JDG, at least, doesn't look as unbeatable as we saw uh, in the 2023 Super Team era. Gen G and T1 still hanging out, still looking pretty. Gen G, uh, I mean, both of these squads level up as a series goes on. Game, Gen G in Game 2 versus Game 1, completely different animal. But T1 has had less for fun type of matchups and seems like they're more business on the rift. Yes, T1 is absolutely still... Uh, cooking as you will finding some different nice picks for Kyria in the bot lane and the other boys to see figure out we're still so early in the season people players still figuring out this meta remember the lcs is the only one that's on live patch so these other guys are maybe a patch or two behind not two patches behind yet but we're still seeing the meta develop in these early spring seasons and t1 case in point the world championship are usually the ones who can kind of dictate how the meta goes because they start winning with some of these crazy picks. And I know it's tricky. You almost want to put BLG, ascend them even higher into this top two, but you're still kind of carrying over. T1 are the world champions and look so good doing it. And Genji beat T1. So until we get more and more games or there's a slight slip up from either Genji or T1, you can't put anyone above them. You either need them, T1, only drop that series to Gen G. You need them to drop a series or at least squeak away, barely get a series win. Same goes for Gen G. They're sitting perfect because BLG and JDG, I mean, BLG especially, done nothing wrong and have looked incredibly dominant, but you're just hard pressed to put them ahead of the defending champs that are the exact same five and the team that beat those defending champs. But Definitely the top three, and you can throw in JDG as a slight afterthought, but either one of these three squads now look absolutely deadly and make me very confident that the West has absolutely no chance at any international event if they are playing close to the level that these three are at right now. They look locked in and ready for a long stay in the top five of the global power rankings, but that is it today for League Unlocked. My name is Eric. Thank you to all you beautiful people for hanging out as always, and you know we'll catch you on that flippity flip.